السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لن فصام لها والله سميع عليم الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور والذين كفروا أولياؤهم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من النور إلى الظلمات أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون اللهم لا تجعلنا منهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد the Quran talks about the believers being pulled out of darknesses, multiple shades of darkness into light on multiple occasions. And the one occasion that I want to talk to you a little bit about inshallah in this session is the one I recited to you. I chose to recite the passage in the beginning because I believe that reciting the Quran and listening to the recitation of the Quran, not only is that an act of worship, but it actually is a, uh, it has an effect on our iman. Listening to the recitation of the Qur'an, the, to the one reciting and the one listening also, it affects and benefits their iman. And if we're going to benefit from something from the understanding of these ayat, we should also benefit from the barakah of its recitation. Plus, of course, it fulfills a beautiful sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He reads onto the people, recites the ayat onto the people. In any case, Allah azza wa jal... If you noticed, I started reciting with the ayah that probably most of you have memorized, which ayah was that? Ayat al-Kursi. And this grand ayah of the Qur'an, Sayyidu Ayat al-Qur'an, Sayyidatu Ayat al-Qur'an, the, the grand leader, the chief ayah of the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa describes some of his most fundamental qualities and how incredibly, how awesome he is, how magnificent he is. That there's no one worthy of worship or obedience in any way, shape, or form except he is. Now you have to understand, Surah Al-Baqarah is a Makki surah, or Madani surah rather. The Prophet ﷺ has already moved to Medina. And the Muslims, some of them have been Muslim from the very beginning, and some of them relatively new, but all of them understand the basics of Islam. And the most basic teaching of Islam is La ilaha illallah, right? It's the most basic teaching of Islam. And this far into the message of Islam, Allah chooses to reveal an ayah that goes back to the basics. This far in. This is like, should be like early Makkan Quran. You should be learning about La ilaha illallah. But Allahu La ilaha illahu comes, and these kinds of ayat come in Madani Quran. You know why? Because they're not just information, they're reminder. Because somebody could say La ilaha illallah and be a Muslim, but they're not conscious of what that really means. And so especially in the Madani Qur'an, when we hear ayat about Iman, when we hear ayat about Tawheed, they're actually a reminder to the Muslims that they need to refresh their Iman. They need to go back to those basics. That I need to hear La ilaha illallah as though I've never heard it before. I have to start over again. 
And this is one of the, you know, the beautiful things in our faith is this tajdeedul iman, the revival of iman. Because our faith is not just an intellectual thing. Everybody knows la ilaha illallah. Everybody here knows it. There's no one in this audience that doesn't know la ilaha illallah. But you know what? Our hearts and our minds are two different things. The heart needs to be reminded of la ilaha illallah so it's shaken by it. We don't feel la ilaha illallah sometimes. The ayat in Medina that remind us of tawheed and remind us of Allah's attributes aren't just there to teach us. They're actually there to shake us up. Allah says, Alam amanu an Isn't it yet time that the believers, their hearts should be full of fear from the remembrance of Allah? And because of whatever came down from the truth. Understand also that in, in, uh, uh, in Madani Quran, the word La ilaha illallah, obviously a negation of any form of shirk. And we shouldn't be associating partners with Allah. When the mushrikun of Makkah, the idol worshippers of Makkah thought about that, they thought this is negating their idols. This is negating the things that they worship, they have around the Kaaba. And Allah is saying none of those should be worshipped, only Allah should be worshipped. But when the same thing is being said to the Muslims in Medina, there are no idols. What idols are there? There's no shirk going on. So when, and by the way, every time La ilaha illallah is mentioned, every time it's mentioned, it's supposed to destroy some form of shirk. It gets rid of shirk. That's part of the definition of the statement. So there is another kind of shirk in Medina. A hidden kind of shirk. There's an obvious kind of shirk in Makkah. It's those idols, you can see them right in front. Allah tal manat al uzza. Allah mentions them by name. But in, and on the other hand, you have another kind of shirk creeping into what is supposed to be a believing community. And this hidden form of shirk, the Quran calls it nifaq, hypocrisy. And so just like the outside shirk has to be destroyed by what? La ilaha illallah. Just like that the inside shirk will be destroyed by la ilaha illallah. Allahu la ilaha illahua. Al Hayyul Qayyum, the, the living, the source of all life, the maintainer of all things, and the source of all things that, that stand, all things that exist. When somebody internalizes that, you know what they realize? No matter how much I think I have accomplished, none of that was me. None of that was me. All of that was Allah. I have no credit. I take no credit. That is entirely given by Allah Azza wa Jal. There are so many more people that are more qualified than I am, that are more intelligent than I am, that are better spoken than I am, that Allah will not give opportunity to. And there are so many more that are much less qualified than I am, and Allah will give them way more opportunities than me, because He's the source. When you will realize He's al hayy then you realize that your life isn't actually yours. It's not yours. It's a gift given by Allah. Which means it can be taken at any moment because he's al hayy He's the eternally living. He's the one maintaining that life. al qayyum And if he's the one maintaining it, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Anyone else, any other living thing needs sleep, needs rest, needs downtime. Sleep doesn't get a hold of him. No, slumber or sleep, he doesn't get drowsy, he doesn't get sleepy. This is by the way, it comes up so much in the Qur'an, we don't even think about it. He keeps saying he owns everything in the skies and the earth. He owns everything in the skies and the earth. By the way, he says he owns everything in the skies and the earth, or whatever lies in the, uh, in the skies and the earth exclusively. He is the only owner of the skies and the earth. You know when you buy your house, and your name's on the title, it says owner and it says your name. When you pay off your, let's just say, Islamic mortgage, and you finally get the deed, and it says owner of the property and your name, just right on top of that, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fil ard. It ain't mine. That's his. That's his. Who remembers that? Who, who thinks when they go into their car, this is, my, this is not my car? Who thinks when they go into their closet and they're putting their clothes on, these aren't my clothes. This is given to me. Who looks at their hand and doesn't think this is, this is my hand? It's not my hand, it's a gift. 
that I didn't pay for. I didn't pay for it. He owns everything in the skies and the earth. Thinking about that will change the way you live. Just thinking about lahu ma fil samawati wa ma fil ard. And when you realize he owns everything, he's in complete charge of everything, then where are you going to go? You know, we go to people when they own something. You go to the judge because he owns authority. You go to the store because they own the merchandise. You go to the lawyer because he owns some expertise. You go to different sources because they own something you need. That's the world. We depend on each other because each of us owns different things in a limited sense. But Allah Azza wa says on Judgment Day, it'll become very clear who owns everything. Because on Judgment Day, you know, in this world, every one of us is in need. I'm in need, I, there's some things I need from my family. There are some things my family needs from me. There are some things I need from my work. And there are some things my work needs from me. There are some things I need from my government. And my government needs something from me. This is a world of interdependent needs. But no day will come that will be clearer about the needs than Judgment Day. If there's one day that you and I will feel need, that's that day. When we don't even have clothes on. When we have no friends left. Anybody we dependent on has disappeared. There's nobody. Nobody. It is the greatest single gathering of humanity ever and yet you will feel the loneliest you have ever felt in your entire existence at the same time. And at that moment, you still need someone, somebody to take your, you know, speak on your behalf. And Allah says, مَن ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who's going to make a case on his behalf? Except if Allah, if, unless if Allah gives him permission. Who are you going to get? You're going to need somebody to speak on your behalf. You will get no one unless Allah grants permission. And He granted that permission to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, this is an honor given to the Messenger. But even the way it's said, man dha, not in man alladhi, man dhalladhi. That dha there is very important. It's, it's even hard to communicate in English what that dha is doing there in the ayah. Man dhalladhi yashfa. Who at all? Anyone out there want to speak on this guy's behalf? Anyone there? And then you come before, you know, this is judgment day is court. You're coming before the judge. And when you come before the judge, you're supposed to bring your case. And if you're trying to defend, if you're the, the you know, the, the accused, and you're in court, when you come before the judge, then you're supposed to say, or your lawyer is at least supposed to say, well, your honor, you don't know the whole story. I know he committed this crime, but there's some background information. He had a tough childhood, society messed him up, it was his friend's fault, something, something. There's some background information that your honor, you should consider before you punish him. You understand? So the lawyer tries to bring up new evidence to defend his plaintiff, the, 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 the accused. Allah says, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ he knows what is in front of them, what they're presenting, and everything behind them. He has more information, background information about them than they have about themselves. What case are you going to bring in front of Allah? What evidence is you going to bring in front of Allah on Judgment Day? يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ On the one hand, he knows everything in front and behind of you, more than you and I will know about ourselves. And on the other hand, you, we, even together, yuhitun, they will all together not be able to encompass anything from his knowledge. Shaybi shay'in min ilmihi. You don't, you can't even know anything from Allah's knowledge. When you and I learn Quran, we learn something that Allah chose to teach us. Some things that Allah chose to teach us. But even that combined is a small, not even something small compared to Allah's knowledge itself. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think we're knowledgeable, we don't know anything. One of my favorite ayat of the Qur'an is about when we're born. When we're born. When we come out of our mothers. Every one of us came out of our mothers. He is the one who took you out of the bellies of your mothers. He delivered you. The doctor didn't deliver you. The push didn't deliver you. The C-section didn't deliver you. 
He is the one who pulled you out of your mothers because there were so many more that came out without life. There are so many more that didn't come out alive. He delivered you the successful delivery. And then he says, by the way, when a baby comes out, does the baby know anything? No. Allah says, لا تعلمون شيئاً He didn't say, you didn't know anything. Because when he brought you out of your, the belly of your mother, this is the past. هُوَ الَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَاضِي هُوَ الَّذِي أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَمْ يَقُلْ مَا عَلِمْتُمْ شَيْئًا لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا شَيْئًا He says, لا تعلمون شَيْئًا Which is a hal and at the same time it could be istinaf. Which means in simple English, you still don't know anything. <laughs> Subhanallah. He didn't just say he brought you out of your moms and you didn't know anything. He says he brought you out of your mothers and you still don't know anything. لا تعلمون شيئًا What are you going to encompass out of Allah's knowledge? What are these ayat doing? They're putting us in our place. Ya Rabb, I don't know anything. The angels had access to the unseen. We read about the arsh. They do tawaf of the arsh. We read about it. We read about the angels. We read about the jinn. They see the angels and the jinn. We read about a lawhul mahfud. They guard the lawhul mahfud. They have way more knowledge than we do. The angels see a lot more. They, they see the seen and Allah has given them the unseen because they're creatures of the unseen. They even know more about ourselves because they write all of our deeds down. The ones we know and the ones we don't remember. They all lock them down. Kitabu marqum, right? They lock them down. And even the angels say, Rabbana la ilma lana. Master, we have no knowledge. We don't know anything. Allah, the angels don't know anything. The angels don't know it. What do I know then? La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. Except what you taught us. That's all we know. Except a little that you've given us. This puts the believer in his place. These ayat are supposed to put us in our place. Iman is about putting yourself down. You don't declare Allah's greatness until you realize how low you are, how low I am. That's how, you know, declaring the takbir of Allah is declaring one's own lowness. There is no higher position than Rabb. And there is no lower position than Abd. There is no job description lower than Abd in the world. Slave is the lowest you can go. You can't go lower than that. You can't, there's no job lower than that. And that's when you realize the true greatness of Allah. Subhanallah. So he says, لا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء Except for whatever he wants. وسيع كرسيه السماوات والأرض His throne, his kingdom. Expands the skies and the earth. Extends to the skies and the earth. وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا And guarding the skies and the earth. Now guardianship is mentioned, so please remember this. Allah says, guarding the skies and the earth does not exhaust him. What do we learn from that? Don't tell me I have... Okay, license plate number... No, it's not. It's always a license plate. What's the other one? Chicken sandwich available for women's entrance. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> totally messed me up. Okay, I'll never forgive you. But anyway, so where were we? Something about Islam or something? <laughs> so, Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا يَؤُدُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا Guarding the skies and the earth doesn't exhaust him. He didn't just tell us he's owning it. He didn't just tell us he owns the universe. He also told us he guards it. You know what that means? He guards everything in it. He guards the sun. He guards the moon. He guards the sky. He guards the cloud. He guards the little bird that leaves the nest. He guards the egg that's still sitting in the nest. He guards you and me when we get in our car. He guards my children when they get on the bus. There is no way that bus will reach the school until Allah guards it. It will not. The, the security system you have installed at home does not guard your house. Allah does. Allah is guarding our health. Allah is guarding our money. It's not the FDIC insurance. It's not. Allah is guarding it. Allah is guarding entire nations, human beings, at every moment of every day. And guarding all of this does not exhaust Allah. 
And human beings, when they think about guarding, in, our, in human experience, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى Human beings know that guarding something comes with exhaustion. You ever seen security guards? What do they do all the time? They sleep. It's exhausting. They have to have shifts. They have to march because if they stand in one place, they go to sleep. <laughs> That's guarding for us. Allah does not get exhausted guarding the entire universe, the, in all of existence. And then so when he tells us, وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ He's the ultimately high, the truly great. Now that he's declared himself this, and you should have iman in him, then he tells us, لا إكراها في الدين There's no, no need, and there's absolutely no room to force anybody in any way, shape or form into the religion. There is no coercion or forcing into Islam. لا إكراها في الدين Why does he say that? You don't have to tell people to come, I don't need them. I don't need them, Allah says, to have iman. Don't force anybody into the deen. Allah is already as high as, you know, can be. The highest imaginable, beyond imagination. He doesn't need his slaves to worship him. Don't force anybody to worship me. I'm telling that to the youth here. Parents are yelling at their children. Make salat, make salat, make salat. Yeah, mom, I know, I know, I know, I know. The youth who you, who you think, oh my God, it's so annoying, man. Every few hours, mom comes back and tells me to make salat, and you know, and then you make salat without making wudu because you don't care. So you just do them. <laughs> That's your rukuwa. That was a rukuwa. It was super fast. <laughs> okay. Allah is letting him. You know. Allah is not forcing you. Your parents might be. Allah says, I don't want it. I don't want that. It's unacceptable to me. Have it your way. Be free. Go ahead. The straight path has already been made very clear from the deviant one. Straightness has already been clarified. People who want to take it, will take it. Then he gives us an image. Whoever will deny forces of rebellion. There are forces of rebellion that want you to believe in them. There's rebellious urges inside you that want you to believe that your temptations will lead you to happiness. That that's what you should believe in. There are forces inside you that think, that make you think your greed is good for you. Your pride is good for you. Your show-off attitude is good for you. They want you to, there, there are things inside you, this fujur inside you, فَأَلْهَمَهَا fujuraha wa taqwaha. Allah is telling us in this ayah, whoever fights the forces of rebellion inside and outside, outside ta'ud is like the leaders, the, fir, the fara'ina of the world, the fir'auns, the idols. Inside us there's ta'ud too, there's rebellious forces inside. Whoever can deny them successfully, وَيُؤْمِن billah, And then believe in Allah. And believe in Allah. See, Iman in Allah was mentioned next. Because you can't really believe in Allah if you haven't conquered the forces of rebellion. Until you've put the rebellion down, what good is Iman? What good is Iman? This surah began, this is towards the end of Al-Baqarah. This surah began talking about shaitan, who knew about Allah, who believed in Allah, who worshipped Allah, but couldn't put his internal rebellion down. Actually, even after Allah calls him kafir, he makes dua to Allah. Anvirni ila yawmi yub'athun. Give me time until the day that they're raised is a dua. He asked Allah for something. When you ask Allah for something, what is it called? Dua. So what if he made dua? He hasn't, he still rebelled. Still a kafir. So don't think just because you're making dua. Did you have iman? Iman is about putting the rebellion down. Don't, don't do it, don't do it. That's, don't do it. That's not, that's not Iman. Then this person who can put that rebellion down inside of them, That's the one that's holding on to an anchor. Like the, the chain of a ship that is so well put together. He's holding on to that anchor. 
Now, when does, where is an anchor? Where is it found? Where is an anchor found? Answer the question. Come on. On a ship. And you're not on the ship. You're obviously in the water because the anchor goes into the water. You're in the water. And there's a storm. The anchor is dropped when the ship needs to stay stable. So you're in a storm in the ocean. You are going to drown unless you hold on to the anchor. Allah says, who can, whoever can put their rebellion down and hold on to Iman and Allah, then they're holding on to that anchor. There's no breaking it. There's no breaks in that. There's no chinks in that armor. That doesn't break. You're saving yourself. The ayah began, I don't need you. The ayah ends, but you need me. That's how it ends. <laughs> You're, you want to drown? Go ahead. Go ahead. But whoever holds on, well, they're holding on to something that doesn't disappoint. malaha. And then comes the next ayah. The ayah about darkness and light. Now that you're in the, you know when Allah describes the ocean in the Qur'an? Allah describes darkness upon darkness. The Qur'an's imagery is all connected. In Surah An-Nur when Allah talks about Bahr, He says, Bahrun Lujji, Bahrun Lujjiyin, Yagshahu Mawjun Min Fawqihi, Mawjun Min Fawqihi Sahab. A deep ocean that is so deep there's no light getting through. Lujji is extremely dark and deep. And then on top of that, there's mo, you know, moj, another wave, and another wave on top of that dark cloud. So there's this dark, 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 dark place. Nighttime in the middle of the ocean. And it's a cloudy night. So even the moonlight can't get through. The stars can't get through. Because you would imagine nighttime in the ocean, you might think the moon is reflecting, right? On the water, when you imagine that scene. But what keeps the moon from even shining through? The cloud, when Fawqihi Sahab, the clouds are there. They block whatever light could have been there. So you are in absolute pitch dark in the ocean, holding on to this anchor if you can. And now appreciate what Allah says. Allah is the protective friend of those who believe. I want you to imagine this, the, the, take, a, take a note of the imagery here. Because Quran speaks in imagery a lot. You just fell off a ship. You have a friend on board the ship. You have a friend on board the ship, and there are different kinds of friends. There's a kind of friend that's on the ship, sees you fall, and goes, Oh, I'm gonna miss you. <laughs> that's it. Then there's a friend that, can, that will do everything in his or her power, and they really want to protect you. The friend that wants to protect you will tell you, Hey, hold on to the anchor, and I will what? I will pull you up. That kind of a friend that wants to protect you is actually in Arabic, it's called a wali. A wali is a friend, but a protective one. Not just a friend that's, you know, gonna ditch you at the, wrong, at the right, right time. That's actually a khadul in Arabic. They say khadul is a friend that acts like they're your buddy until you need them and they disappear. When trouble shows up, they disappear. You know, the shaitan is khadul. He's a kind of friend. He's always hanging out with you. <laughs> He's always there. He talks to you a lot. He talks to you more than anybody else probably. When the time shows up though, when trouble comes, he's out of there. Shaitan is egging on the kuffar, egging them on, egging them on. They go all the way to the battle of Badr and then he sees the angels coming from the other side. And he says, oh, I got nothing to do with this. I'm out. You guys on your own now. I've misguided you as far as I can. <laughs> you know? Allah Azza wa calls himself Wali in the next ayah and says, Allahu Waliyu Ladina Amanu. Allah is the protective friend of those who have come to the faith. This is a very heavy ayah because Allah did not say, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, fi hikmatihi, lam yaqul, Allahu Waliyu al mu'mineen, fi hadi ayah. There's a difference in the Arabic language between saying mu'min and saying alladhi amana. There's a difference. One's verbal in nature and the other's nominal in nature. And nouns in Arabic represent permanence. When Allah talks about a mu'min is someone stable in their iman. And when Allah talks about al-mu'minun, He only compliments them. So He says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ al-mu'minun. People that are mu'min have already attained success. But when He talks about al-ladhina amanu, He even criticizes them sometimes and says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا لَكُمْ مَا لَكُمْ What's wrong with you? He doesn't criticize al-mu'minun, but He does criticize الذين 
amanu, because their iman is not settled yet. They've entered iman, but it hasn't become concrete yet. Abhi kacha hai thoda. That's what it is. It's not there yet. But in this incredible ayah, Allah says He is offering His protective friendship to the person who has weak iman, strong iman, strongest iman, bordering on nifaq, doesn't matter if he or she said La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah is offering His protective help if you want it, it's there. Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu. Allah is offering to become your wali, doesn't matter what state of iman you are so long as you're a believer. Doesn't matter what level, what rank you're at. So you don't say Allah is only wali to the highest level of Allah wali al la la la. Alladheena amanu jami'an, kulluhum, all of them. Yukhrijuhum min al dhulumati ila nur. And the proof of that is in the next part of the ayah. He pulls them out of various shades of darkness. Dhulumat jama'ah. Various shades of darkness into an-nur, into the light. If they were people of iman, why would they be in darkness? Because just because you're in iman doesn't mean you have, don't have some darkness. That's why he doesn't say al-dhulma, the darkness. He says shades of darkness, multiple shades of darkness. Some of you have the darkness of envy. Others have the darkness of anger. Others have the darkness of greed. Others have a, the darkness of narcissism and self-obsession. Others have the darkness of materialism. Others have the darkness of cheating and lying and stealing and multiple different kinds of darknesses within people who claim to be Muslims. Allah says, I am willing to pull you out of those darknesses. No matter what your darkness is, I'm willing to pull you out to the light, ila nur, to the light. You notice before, Allah started talking that He owns everything. He owns everything. Then He talked about He guards everything. Remember that? And on top of guarding everything, He wants to protect who especially? You. He's protecting the entire universe. He's even protecting the ocean you're drowning in. He's even protecting the anchor you're holding. But He's offering you His special protection. Offering you special protection. And He's willing to pull you out. يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ And He continues to pull them out. Which means it's not a one-time thing. Allah guided me. I could feel Allah guided me last Ramadan. I felt closer to Allah than I've ever felt before. But it's gone now. No. It's not أَخْرَجَهُمْ It's يُخْرِجُهُمْ He keeps doing it. He keeps doing it. He keeps doing it. You keep going back to Allah. Allah will keep pulling you out. You keep, but you have to admit to Allah first. Let me tell you, one of the most beautiful things I heard when I was at Hajj this year, in one of the khutub at Hajj, the Shaykh said, you know, a dua aw yawm al dua yawm al i'tiraf. Faqabla al dua nahtaj ila al i'tiraf. He says, the day of dua is the day of admission. Before you make dua, you need to admit who you are. You have to confess to Allah what your darknesses are. You, have, you know what they are, nobody else does. You know what they are, you have laziness. You don't pay attention in salat. You have filthy habits that nobody knows about. You have anger, you're hiding secrets. You've cheated someone, you've lied against, you know those, what, you know what they are. You have to admit them to Allah and then ask you to pull them out of that, pull you out of that darkness. And then he says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاؤُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ and those who disbelieved, those who are ungrateful, those who don't hold on to ang the anchor, then their protective friends are just the, the same forces of rebellion. They're, that's the only protection they get. It's from those entities. يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ He brings them out of light into various shades of darkness. Now the question arises, how are disbelievers in light? Because it says disbelievers are taken from light into Darkness. So how can disbelievers be in light to begin with? I thought disbelievers from the very beginning are in the darkness. So what light? Allah Azza wa is teaching us that all human beings start off with light. We all start off, we don't, we're not born into sin. This is not Christian creed. This is the Iman in Allah Azza wa teaches us that human beings are born in Iman. They have the potential of faith. When they don't exercise that muscle, then it goes into darkness. One of the most wise anecdotes and examples to help me understand this that one of my teachers gave, Dr. Abdul Samir, may Allah protect him, he gave this example. He said, you know, when you exercise a muscle, it gets stronger. 
But when you don't exercise a muscle, it gets weaker. And you know, if somebody's lying in bed, they're lying in bed for six months, eight months, ten months, and they don't get up, guess what? After ten months, when they try to get up, their legs don't work. They lose it. The ability to accept guidance is a muscle Allah put inside us. If you exercise that muscle, it'll get stronger. If you don't exercise that muscle, reminder comes to you, advice comes to you, opportunity comes to you, prayer time comes to you, and you, you ignore it and you ignore it. That ability to accept guidance starts getting weaker until that muscle dies. And then it doesn't matter if it's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest of all teachers and speakers, speaking to you the greatest of all speech, the Quran itself, it won't matter because your muscle is dead. It won't matter now, because you didn't exercise it when it was still alive. لِيُنذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا So you can warn someone who's still alive. That's what Allah says. He pulls pe the, the taghut, the rebellious forces, the rebellious urges inside of us, pull pe pe people out of light that Allah gave them, endowed them with, in, with their birth, and puts them back into shades of darkness. Those are going to be the people of fire. Those are the people of fire, the companions of fire in which they'll remain. The last nuance I'll share with you, it's difficult to share because it has to do with the Arabic language. I'm going to try my best to make it easy to, un to understand inshallah ta'ala. And that is that, you know, there are, there's two comparisons. There's a comparison in this ayah. In this ayah, there's a comparison between two relationships. Believers have a relationship with Allah. And disbelievers have a relationship with the entities of rebellion, taghut. Right? Believers have a relationship with Allah. And disbelievers with what is in Arabic called taghut, the rebellious, the extremely rebellious, which is inside and outside, as I mentioned. And the name of both relationships is the same. Allah to us is wali. The name of that relationship, you know, on the two sides of that relationship is us and Allah. And the name of that relationship is wali. And the relationship between taghut and the disbelievers is also wali. Awliya'uhum at taghut. It's the same name. It's the same relationship. So again, I'll repeat what I said so I can build it slowly. Two relationships are being compared. Now let me hear it from you. What's the first relationship between? Believers and Allah. And what's the name of that relationship? Wali. What's the second relationship? Disbelievers and Taghut. And that relationship is also Wali. <laughs> now listen. Listen carefully. I'll, I'll be done, I promise. I gotta finish this point. Who is the Wali in the first relationship? Allah is. Who is the Wali in the second relationship? Everybody clear about that? The wali in the first relationship is Allah and the wali in the second relationship is taghut. You with me? You know what that means? That means the dominant part. In every relationship there's a dominant party and there's a sub-party. Teacher, student, parent, child, wife, husband. I'm kidding. <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. Anyhow, <laughs> in this relationship, who's the dominant party? Allah, believers. In the second relationship, who's the dominant party? Taghut, disbelievers. You understand? Now what does Allah do? Allahu waliyyul ladheena amanu. When Allah described His relationship, He mentioned Himself first. Then He mentioned the believers. In the... In the the ayah continues and he says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاؤُهُمْ أَطَّاهُوتُ The dominant party in the second relationship is who? أَطَّاهُوت And where are they mentioned if you heard the Arabic? In the beginning or at the end? At the end. But you know in language there's this idea of expected sequence. So in the first case the dominant and the secondary was mentioned. So you're expecting the second time also, the dominant, and then the secondary will be mentioned. So the sequence would have been, وَالطَّاهُوتُ أَوْلِيَاءُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Would have been like that. Keep the sequence. But Allah in His wisdom decides that when He was mentioned first, with the believers, the ta'ut do not deserve to be mentioned the same place Allah was mentioned in the sentence. So they're pushed to the end. They're not even compared to Allah. There is no comparison. 
Not even in the language, so the word goes at the end, because it doesn't deserve the same seat as Mubtada. <laughs> you know, It becomes the khabar in grammar, actually. Now there's two Mubtadas and a khabar. That's where grammar becomes sweet, man. That's why you gotta learn grammar. Quran becomes juicy. Seriously, you just, you taste it. You taste, and what translation is gonna communicate that? What translation is gonna, by the way, did you notice Taghut all the way at the end? This Ta'khir, this Taqdeem, these principles. I'm not just saying that to make you feel bad. Every one of you can learn Arabic, every one of you can. There's not a single person here who cannot. The question is whether you want to or not. That's the only question. Allah has guaranteed to make it easy. Allah, I'm telling you, I was a terrible student of the language. Terrible, a terrible student of, in college. I'm the guy that studies the day before the exam and is okay with a 70. I'm that guy. But when I decided to study Arabic in Queens, you know, it was like people after a khutbah they come to me and say, where did you study Arabi? I said, Queens. <laughs> you know, from a Sheikh al Queensy. <laughs> It doesn't have to be exotic, guys. It doesn't have to be under a tree in a desert. It doesn't. You can learn. But I tell you, if you want to get closer to Allah's word, Allah will open those doors. Because Allah is the wali of those who believe. Allah will make it easy for you. So what if you're a bad student and everything else? Allah will make you top notch in Quran. Because you wanted to do it, because you wanted to get closer to Him, and you wanted to hold on to an anchor. You wanted to taste it for yourself. You know? That's what you wanted. I want to be able to have this conversation without explaining a word of it to you and just go straight to the Arabic itself. And everybody here understands it. And we can get there. We can get there as a people. In my previous session when I talked about set goals for yourself, I mean it. Set goals for yourself. Don't just say, oh, I can't believe it. They already reached there. I'm never going to get there. Don't think like that. Take one thing at a time. خُذْ ma tafalak, the Arab says. Take what's in front of you. Pay attention. Don't lose sight of it. Don't memorize one surah and hold it up, like hold the pages of the mushaf like this, of the one surah you memorize, and then compare it to the rest of the pages that are left and say, oh my God. <laughs> Don't do that. You remember, this is good. Just look at the next page. Don't look at the rest of it and say, oh. <gasps> you know, Hibs kids do that. They compare the thickness of the pages. Like, yeah, it's getting skinnier. You know? <laughs> So I, I was asked to share the Qur'an's perspective from, of darkness to light. There's a lot more that can be said about this beautiful passage. But, you know, and I, and I didn't give you a dars quran in the previous session, so I figured at least I make this one a dars quran Thank you so very, very much for listening, alhamdulillah. If you get a chance, memorize the ayat. Now that you've heard a little bit about them, memorize them and then pray, the, pray with them. Pray with these ayat in salat there towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Find them. I won't tell you the ayat numbers. Find them. It's okay, spending a little extra time with the Qur'an, I know it's gonna hurt, it's like a root canal for some of you, but that's okay, do it. Take the time, find the ayat, where's the end of Al-Baqarah, and then sit there and as a family, memorize them. That's when you walk out of a conference saying, okay, we got something out of this that we can be closer to Allah, not just at the session, but we, we got closer to Qur'an as a result. Inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa alaikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.